You know, for the longest time, I was totally against using a portable monitor. I guess I just hadn't found the right one yet. Welcome back to Hammer on Box, everyone. As always, I'm Jeff. Back in February, I reviewed what is likely one of the best portable gaming monitors on the market. In the Intahill, hold on, I gotta remember the model name. YTH173PN-A7201D. Yeah, what he said. I've long stated that portable monitor should bring some kind of value add to your laptop, like freezing compatibility, color accuracy, or even a touchscreen. Luckily, that's exactly what we have here in the latest monitor from Intahill, the YTH156PXT. Just like last time, the name may not be catchy, but the specs on the panel are insanely impressive. This is a 15.6 inch 1080p display with a 700 nit max brightness, FreeSync and HDR600 support, all packaged in a CNC aluminum frame. If that was the end of the spec list, it'd be all right for the $245 asking price. Good, but not great. Even adding a 10 point capacitive touchscreen doesn't make me excitedly jump out of my chair. No, that's reserved for the QLED panel and advertised 99.7% DCI-P3 color accuracy. Let's start with just how freakishly bright the screen is, thanks to its Samsung Quantum Dot LED display. 700 nits easily outperforms most laptops and portable screens on the market, including the 500 nit display in my MacBook Pro M1. That also means that HDR content on the PXT is stunningly beautiful, especially when compared to most other mobile displays on the market. Black images on the screen are around on par with traditional LCDs, and slightly better than the MacBook's built-in display. However, the lack of localized dimming zones means that halos are present around pretty much every element on a black background. But it still didn't keep me from enjoying media playback, both in standard and HDR modes. Also, can I just stop and note that it would be fantastic for Apple and Microsoft both to implement working color schemes into their OS elements for HDR displays? HDR monitors are only worth enabling if you can still use the system as a computer when you're not watching HDR content. It's beautiful watching media in HDR, but I would rather leave it turned off because I find the OS to be completely unusable. Thanks for coming to my TED Talk. Color accuracy was definitely one of the main focuses on this panel, but does it live up to Intahill's lofty claims? Testing with a Spider X Pro and DisplayCal 3 revealed mostly good news. While I wasn't able to measure 100% gamut coverage of the DCI-P3 space, scoring only 91%, it is still vastly better than most portable displays out there. Heck, it even bested the MacBook Pro display in DCI coverage, which is pretty impressive. Combine this with the 99% sRGB and 89% Adobe RGB ranges, and this makes a pretty compelling travel companion for both photogs and video editors alike. Gaming was also definitely an afterthought on the PXT, despite the presence of menu options that might make you think otherwise. The panel is only 60 hertz, and has the same pretty awful 2 watt speakers that are in most other Intahill monitors. You do get FreeSync, which I'd rather have than not have, but the pixel response time is pretty terrible, with quite a bit of ghosting on any motion elements at all. This is one area the panel definitely did not live up to the spec sheet, and the claimed 2 millisecond response time. There's also a curious feature missing that the 240Hz gaming panel has, and this one is missing, and that's the USB-C on the go port. It might seem insignificant, but the presence of an on the go port means the difference between using a single cable to connect every peripheral on your laptop, and rummaging around to find power, display, ethernet, and any other dongles you need to use on your desk. It's odd to me that the gaming panel would have this feature, but it's completely missing on the more professionally minded display. Other than that, the ins and outs are pretty much the same. You've got two USB Type-C ports, one for power in and one for display and touch input. With power going into the monitor, you can charge your laptop from the monitor as well. Although I don't have any specs on the wattage provided, so your results may vary for this. One interesting addition is the 10-point multi-touch layer to this monitor. I'm actually a big fan of touchscreens on laptops, as they have the potential to add new and creative input options for applications. It should be noted, however, that I hate the Mac Touch Bar with a fiery passion. Function keys are physical inputs, Tim. The inclusion of a touchscreen has the potential to improve ergonomics of using a laptop with two screens, as I find using a second screen a bit uncomfortable without adding in a keyboard and mouse, as either the laptop or the second display are going to wind up at kind of an odd angle. While the touchscreen input is accurate and relatively low latency, it feels just a bit wasted because of software, and I'm looking at Windows and Mac OS on this one. Windows 10 and 11 both have some touch-based elements for notifications and quick menus, but the interface is anything but smooth or responsive. 
In Windows 11, swiping in from either side simply pops out an overlay for widgets or notifications. And as a side note, widgets require you to be signed in with a Microsoft account, because of course they do. And while Apple may have the iPad in their corner, which defined multi-touch inputs, including integrating touchscreen support to Mac OS thanks to the iPad and Sidecar, dare I say navigating Mac OS is even more difficult than Windows. Multi-touch gestures are not recognized unless you use Apple's own trackpad, which means hooking up a multi-touch display is kind of a moot point. The left mouse click inputs are also delayed at best and ignored altogether at worst. To make matters worse, both Windows and Mac will apply touch inputs to the wrong screen if your cursor is on your laptop display. That's right, if you want to use the touchscreen on the touchscreen, you have to move the cursor over to the touchscreen monitor first. Otherwise, you're going to be sending touch inputs to the other display. Interacting with mobile apps on the touchscreen does work moderately well, but again, software implementation is not great here. iPad apps running in macOS refuse to run in widescreen, opting for the iPad non-pro aspect ratio of 4x3. Even games that offer native touch support, like Tabletop Simulator, are anything but the top-notch experience we're used to getting on phones and tablets. Even though Intel's touchscreen implementation is a solid feature and very well executed, I feel it's held back by things that are well beyond their control. So, what's the verdict here? If you're shopping for a portable monitor and are strictly after more of a professional workflow, this is a monitor made for creative professionals, the run and gun video editor, the YouTuber at CES. And at just $245, it's priced at a point where it's almost crazy not to pick one up. If you're interested in checking out the Intel YTH156PXT for yourself, I will have affiliate links down in the video description below. On your way down there, make sure to drop this video a like and subscribe to Craft Computing if you haven't done so already. Follow me on Twitter at Craft Computing to keep up with my daily shenanigans like this. And if you like the content you see on this channel and want to help support me in what I do, consider joining the Patreon or Floatplane. Links are also down below. As an added bonus, you can join my exclusive Discord server, where you can chat directly with myself and the other hosts from Talking Heads. And yes, that means I might actually be able to help you with your problem. Random Twitter DMers and senders of emails to my business inquiries account. That's going to do it for me in this one, guys. Thank you so much for watching. And as always, I will see you in the next video. Cheers, guys. From Brown Bomber Brewing, this is 12.5's Rebel Hard Coffee, a cold brew malt beverage. Now, normally, I'm not really the biggest fan of malted beverages, but uh, this one kind of caught my interest. For when you want to have some coffee in your Zoom meeting. Drink different for those who seek experience over ordinary. 12.5's Rebel with a bold blend of 100% Colombian cold brew coffee and a hint of sweetness takes you to the fringes of extraordinary. There's a little rebel in all of us. 4.2% and only 115 calories. This is not coffee. Oh my God, that is awful. You know when you're in the middle of nowhere and you stop for gas in the middle of a 600 mile road trip and you need a coffee to keep going, but the only pot there is from like a week ago and the only other alternative is those powdered instant coffee hot machines where they dump like half a gallon of powder into your cup and then top it off with some scalding hot water. Um, this tastes like that, only now it's cold. <laughs> the flavor will not go away. Uh, I don't know if I can drink this. Nope, nope, nope. I'm out, tap out. That's it. <laughs> that is awful. Ah. Uh. And that's coming from someone who even kind of likes those powdered coffees occasionally. That is horrible. New plan. Anything but that. All right, actual beer for today is from Ex Novo. Yours is mine. This is a coffee oatmeal stout brewed with coffee from Rosaline Coffee in Portland, Oregon. 7%. Oh, that's so much better. 
you know, for only a 7% stout, that is super dark. I'm not gonna call it great because I can still taste the rebel. I wholeheartedly disagree. If there's a little rebel in all of us, we'd all be dead. You know, there's not much coffee in that. For being in a coffee oatmeal stout, there's the creaminess I was expecting. Usually oatmeal stouts end up being a very, very thick mouthfeel, but they have this, I mean, it's like oatmeal. <laughs> it's kind of in the name, right? Uh, Everything okay up there? Okay. They have this this creamy, very, very smooth finish, uh, despite the very, very thick body on it for only a 7% beer. That's a beer I can drink. <laughs> so in my last couple videos, my Samsung Health app has reminded me that I'm a fat sack of crap and maybe should get up and walk every once in a while, even though I've been doing that on a fairly regular basis. This time it interrupted the middle of my shoot because I've been waking up early in the morning lately and it said, wow, you've been sleeping from 11 p.m. to 5 a.m. Would you like me to automatically adjust your sleep schedule? No, I'm not waking up at 5 a.m. on purpose. 